Good morning to everybody. Uh, today we are doing kind of a third class in this course series, uh, cybersecurity course. Uh, let me remind you what we did in the last uh, two lectures. In the first lecture, more about the introduction. We didn't do anything kind of important. Instead of that, we just uh, laid our background uh, to the course. Uh, we discuss what is information, uh, cyber security and uh, what cyber means and which kind of things we're going to discuss throughout this course. Uh, and we discuss a little bit of uh, basic graphic stuff. Uh, and then we discuss on uh, kind of uh, key strengths, brute force attacks and so on. Then we start, uh, did our second lecture. Maybe you remember that. Uh, they are what we did is the malicious uh, software. Any software which not behave as they supposed to, we call it as malicious software. Uh, so we discuss the categories of malicious software, mainly two categories, one which require a host program, that means the malicious software attached to the existing software. The other one is the open program. Open program means uh, open uh, without having host program. That means they could kind of write directly to your hard disk and execute that from there. Uh, so these are the two categories of malicious software which we discussed in the last week. So in the need host program category, we could see several uh, variations. We discussed that trap doors, logic boards, Trojan noses, uh, and main categories viruses and we discussed the life cycle of virus and how it works and so on. Then we start discussing on the independent malicious of test that is worms and boats, uh, what you call it as zombies. So among them I mentioned that boats or the zombies are the more dangerous part of malicious software right now because uh, they keep silent in our computers and steal our co confidential data, resources, and maybe our kind of resources such as bandwidth, memory, processing power, and so on. So zombies usually hide in your machine as much as possible to steal those information. Because of that, uh, in, in, in the part of cybersecurity, protecting or defending ourselves against those uh, zombies or the boat are are other other thing is uh, there are zombies uh, boat nets available some people can even purchase in the computer underwear so they can pay and purchase a zombie network so wh why people are purchasing such networks to attack the other people uh, to execute denial of service attacks for the other people maybe to send thousands of spams like that then we discuss how do you kind of uh, mitigate this risk uh, in the, the very simple level. Right. In the next topic we are supposed to do is uh, web security. In the web security there are two parts of web security. So one is kind of a communication security, other one is application security. Communication security basically discuss on how a browser and the server get communicate securely. So you know in the cyber security, the web is the main core part, internet, or in the, actually web, web communication, worldwide web communication. There are two softwares mainly used on those web communication, you know, web servers and the browsers. So we have to know how do this, how do they communicate each other in a secure manner. So as I understood in the first two lectures, as most of the audience are having problems on cryptography. Uh, because I, when I start this thing on web security protocol, especially TLS, transport layer security protocol, and how it works, you should have fundamental knowledge on the basic cryptography. You don't need to about how algorithm works, but you have to have a concept of those cryptography. Otherwise, you get confused. Because I want to introduce uh, the session keys, certification authorities, the private keys, public keys, and how do they get exchanged, 
what are the problems behind that and then i would like to show you how this man in the middle attack works and so and so in those situations you have to know exactly how this cryptography uh, concepts works so because of that i thought of taking i will take some time today uh, to go through from the hash algorithm to the public key cryptography uh, and give you a very brief introduction as we mentioned at the very beginning there is a separate course run somewhere in end of this year or the next year beginning which discuss the cryptography in detail so those cryptographic algorithms and the functions of those algorithms in detail we would discuss in the separate course so here i just want to give a fundamental idea about those right now and they are kind of a work how they work each uh, work each other uh, uh, to start before starting this tls session otherwise you get confused and i may have face difficulties to explain this tls protocols in the last questions in the last two sessions i understood that uh, we need to do this okay let's start now uh, in the fundamental of cryptography which require to discuss tls so that's what i am taking in this class today right so we start from hashing algorithm we discuss a lot on hashing algorithm uh, as you remember uh, one of the main algo cryptographic algorithm we use for today cryptographic protocols are the hash so hash mainly used for checking the integrity of information so whoever who uh, some data get changed the hash will change i will show you in addition to that hash used to check the message integrity during the communication especially when the web browser talk to a web server there are data exchange in between these two entities so if someone alter those at the middle we need to detect that so mainly hash algorithm used for that so in addition to the hashing there is another algorithm called message authentication code or the mac code i will take it in a minute after explaining the hash the other thing is especially when the uh, financial transaction over the cyber space we need the feature what we call non repudiation i'll discuss later on in that feature we use our electronic signatures or we call it as digital signatures in the digital signature we require hashing as well right so hashing are as i explained again hashing is one way algorithm whatever we have the data we go to put to this hashing algorithm and it produces the 8 bit code so it a size of the code is not relevant to the message size message size is any size which feed it to this particular hashing algorithm create a fixed length of code the length of this code depend on the hashing algorithm right now there are two main categories of hashing algorithm one popular category is called as message digest version 5 or md5 hashing algorithm message digest version 5 algorithms are vulnerable i will show you in the lecture today how it get vulnerable why we say so and then there is other set of algorithm what we call sha1 algorithm secure hashing algorithm uh, sha it's a sha has several versions what you call sha1 sha120 sha256 usually recommended hash algorithm nowadays are sha256 that is secure hash algorithm with key uh, hash size is 256 bits long 256 bits long hash right especially hash algorithms are one way and it not reversible but there are method of what we call hash reverse lookups i will show it again i also show it in the first lecture you remember so basically hash algorithm has a property so it what we call it as we cannot create two messages with having similar hash so for example so uh, you you in the previous slide you 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 you, you notice that so there is a fixed code so if the code size is 256 bit so maximum code we can have it there is 2 to the power 256 bits so we have a messages in the message a domain if you consider 
we have infinite set of messages. We don't know the size. So there are so many messages, infinite. So infinite set of messages reduced to finite set of code using this algorithm. If you do so, definitely you understand theoretically there are more than one message which creating the same mess, obviously. Because there are infinite set, we reduce to finite set. So finite set size, if you use 256 hashing, 2 to the power 256 is the maximum code we're having there. So if you map that infinite messages to these finite codes, so obviously there are two messages here, more than two messages which creating the same mess. The algorithm of hashing in design in such a way, real time, we cannot find two messages which create this mess. So that is the strength of this hashing algorithm. If someone can find X and Y which creating the same hash in the real time, so that is called as hash collision. So those, it's then in, infeasible to use, in, impractical to use. So we should find a hashing algorithm such a way people is people may need to spend a lot of time to find such and sir, <coughs> sorry, for interrupt. Sir, sorry participant can message uh, could you please go a little bit slow okay 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 i will i will, I will, I will uh, teach slow. sure okay, thank, thank you very much for the feedback okay. right so in, in practically what i mentioned is There are two messages. Uh, there are, when you say the message domain, there is a thousands, uh, millions of messages, infinite messages. And in the hashing codes, it's a limit, limited code. So if a hash algorithm is SHA1, size of the code is 160 bit. If hash algorithm is 256 bits, uh, number of course there is 2 to the power 256 bits so so if you try to match with the hashing algorithm infinite set of messages to the finite code so there are over two messages which creating the same hash definitely so however we should we are defining the hashing algorithm in such a way it is difficult to someone to find two messages which creating the same hash. So for example, if we can find X and Y which having the same hash within one minute, so this is not a good hashing algorithm. If you cannot find X and Y which creating the same hash in a year of time, then maybe it is a good hashing algorithm. Right. So I will discuss a little bit of application of hashing because in the cyber perspective of cybersecurity, that is very important. Any system, including cybersecurity systems, <coughs> sorry, uh, uh, we need to create uh, usernames and the password. Hashing are the main technologies which we use to create username and the password. So basically, you know, uh, when you want to create users, we create username and we take the password of the user, then somehow, we have to store this password. How we store those password? Basically, most of the people sometimes still they use the store the password as it is. That means in any cybersecurity system, back in there is a database. In this database server, there is a table, call it as user table. In that user table, we can see usernames and the corresponding password of these users. So obviously, users have to type correct name to log in. However, system admins or who control the servers can see this password table. So then they could know what is the password of Alice, what is the password of Bob. So we say we should never ever store password in clear form. But I still see some applications which are running all over the world still store in the password in clear form. We should not store in the password in clear form in any cyber security system, right? Or any system, any information system, not only cyber, any, any information system. So then how do you store the password? Someone asked, maybe we convert into the encrypted form. 
No, that is the, not the best way of storing the password. password. If you store the password in encrypted form, then what happened? Someone need to decrypt it before verify. Server has to decrypt the password before verify. This encryption, decryption require a security key. That security key then should do should store somewhere. So that security key may, may be stored on the same database. Then there are no security at all because if some attacker or the admin who has access to the database can get a security key using that security key, they can decrypt the password. So that is not a good solution. The good solution to protect the password is hashing. So that's why these hashing algorithms are very important. So they are what we do. So if let's say Alice created his password, we want to save that password in the password table. So how do we do? We calculate the hash of the password. Usually capital H represents hashing function. So PWA here means password. So we put the, our Alice password to the hashing algorithm H and we get back as hash of the Alice password, we store it in this database. Similarly, when Bob create the password, we get the hash of this Bob password and store it in the database. So all the hash values of the passwords will store it in the database against their username. So when you do so, uh, at the creation of those passwords, uh, we will do so. Right, now, how do you verify them? In order to verify those passwords, some, uh, when at the time user logs in, what's happen? So at the time user logs in, user type the username and the password. Soon as user type the password, now we have to check whether that password is similar to the password which created. So the passwords are now in the hash forms. So in, if the password is hash forms, you know, we cannot get it back. We cannot get it back, this password. How do you then verify? Verification do is in the opposite way. That means if the user type the password at the time of verification, system will calculate hash of that password. So then we store the hash passwords in the database. So then we compare the password entered at the verification time to, uh, with the uh, hash of the password, uh, with the hash of the password which store in the database. So user we type the password, we calculate the hash, and we check that hash is equivalent to the hash in the table of the database. So if though both hashes are equal, then we know the user enter same X or the same password at the creation time as well as verification time. That's how we verify the password. However, that is also not recommended. So for example, if we use a proofs, Google want to prove that, verify that the uh, type is sacred, it goes to the server side, server calculate a hash of the sacred, this case is sacred, and get a verification key. So he check whether the verification key is equal to the hash stored on the password. So that we usually do. It also not secure. So actually, it's also not secure. Why so? Why some attacker can do pre-calculation of hash? So, for example, so if there are, you know, there are thousands of online dictionaries on the internet. So, what we attackers can do? Attacker can get words on those dictionaries and calculate hash of those existing words and they keep a database with those hashes. So if someone find the hash of a user password, what the attacker do, attacker try to search on those huge databases whether this hash exists. So if that hash exists in attacking database, so then he knows corresponding word which create this hash. So then he knows the password. So it's kind of looking at the hashes in a pre-calculated database. So that is called it as dictionary attacks in the passwords. Dictionary attacks pre-calculate the hash values and store in huge databases. If someone got access to these password tables, 
for the hash tables, they get those hashes and check whether that hash is existing in, in those tables. If they found, they know, okay, so this hash is this, and this is the password of that person. So that's how they break it, break it in. So because of that, we need to get some precaution for that. <coughs> precaution we are taking to protect such uh, uh, dictionary attacks over the password system in, in the cyberspace is adding a salt. Salt is kind of, some student also asked a question in the uh, first lecture. So what is salt and what is the recommended length of salt? So basically I'll explain right now. Salt is some additional value which we use at the time of saving the password. Let's say there is a book, create a password PWP. So in previous method, we create a hash of PWP, a password of hash, and so on. Now we add the soul to that. Soul means random value. We create a random value. Recommended length of soul salt right now is 64 bits, 64 bits, eight characters, eight character random value. We usually get that eight character random value, add it to the password, and calculate hash of both. Soul and the password together hash. So then, even someone use the same password, so that they ended up with different hash values because at the two instances, there are two salts added, right? So then, with Bob, when the Bob want to save the password, so he add the salt to his password and to create a hash and store that in the password tape. So that's what we do. So then what's happened? If we do so, dictionary attacks are difficult because dictionary attacks, what they do, they calculate the hash of known passwords and store it in the table. Now they can't do that because even for some passwords, the souls are different. There are two to the power 64 type of souls. So for each hash, so then we need to create each add password to sort of different sort and then calculate uh, hashes for all those sorts, one password and all the sorts. So it's getting difficult. So people do so as well in some attacks. Some people call it as rainbow tables uh, like that. So however, doing, try to do so is a huge calculation. And sometimes it's not practical to do such calculation offline. So because of that, breaking the password using dictionaries, known words are difficult when you add the salt. However, if you add the salt in your password table in the database, uh, look like this. We have to uh, store the username and we have to store the salt and we have to store the hash of the salt and the password. So we concatenate password to the salt and calculate the hash and we store that, right? So in the next time, some, if the user wants to verify, then what, what user has to do, user type the password, so then system take the password and system look at the database and get the salt corresponding to that user then the system at this concatenate that salt to the parcel and calculate the hash and check whether that hash is equal to the hash stored in the table. So that's how they verify. So if someone attacks such a parcel table which consists of the salt, so they have to do it most of the time, they have to do it real time. They cannot do offline attack, such as dictionary attacks. So that is the uh, method which we use to store the hash values, or store the passwords, right? So as you may understood, in the point of cybersecurity, authentication is the main part. Usually we do authentication using username and the passwords. So then the method we use to store the password is hashing algorithm. Not only that, uh, so there are so many other applications of hashing. By the way, I forgot to tell, so when you, when you have some system, so when you forget the password, what we can do, what we can do is reset the password. 
if there is a system, if you forget the password, if that system tells you the password, so this system is not a good system. Because that means that particular cyber system store your password in plain form or store your password in encrypted form. That's why they can give you back your password. If real secured system cannot give you back the password, why? They are not storing the password. They are storing hash of your password. So if you forget your password, even system admin have no way to recover your password. Only method they can do is reset your password. So that's why usually systems, when you forget the password, request you to reset the password. Otherwise, uh, systems should be able to tell your password. They are not be able to tell why. They are not storing the direct passwords. If some system tells you the password, so definitely you should know they are storing the same passwords and they are not a good system. Right. And as I mentioned, not on the hash, uh, uh, password storage. Hashes has so many other applications. One of the other main applications which, you, you, which we use hashing for digital forensics. So for example, if crime goes on, we have to investigate on evidence. So that call it as forensic investigation. So usually during the forensic investigations, we have to make sure content is not changed. So how do you make sure whether that content is not changed? Or how do you prove in front of the court? So you did the investigation and you didn't change the co uh, content. So for that, we are using hash. So usually what we do, uh, before start the investigation, you have to calculate the hash value of the data you're going to investigate. So then, after the investigation, you have to recalculate these hash values and show the people both are the same. So then people know you didn't plant any evidence. Because in, if any evidence in electronic, anyone can plant the bogus evidence. So there should be mechanism to stop that. So the mechanism we use there is again hash. So you understood hashing is a very important operation. <clears throat> I will show you how this hashing works in simple way. And later on, I show you this hashing algorithm, which we call it as MD5 is not secure. It's, it's broken. So in your systems, any of your cybersecurity system, firewalls or whatever, if you still use MD5, that's the time to change it. Change it to SHA-256. So let me show that uh, simple demo, uh, how to calculate hashes and how to uh, verify uh, those hashes and, uh, and these collisions of MD5 hash values. I will share my terminal to you uh, to do the demo. So you can use any, any uh, uh, Linux based terminal uh, 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 to do uh, to try those things. Uh, let me show it uh, sharing my uh, terminal uh, to you. All right. Uh, all right. Uh, so this is my terminal. Uh, let me see. I go to some folder. All right. So, so I think everybody see my terminal. It's a. I'm using Mac anyway. It's a Linux. Uh, for uh, so so you can use any Ubuntu or Linux based terminal uh, and try that. Uh, so in a Linux based terminal, if you want to calculate hash, uh, there is a 
command call uh, uh, md phi sum if you want to uh, calculate uh, a hash of a file in uh, linux systems so there is a command call md phi sum right uh, so i will show you there is a file on my uh, folder so, so i type something here you see so i want to calculate hash of that in the mac system this command called md5 and i type the file name my file name is text right so you see this hash value so this is the hash value of the file called text right so the algorithm i use md5 so i can change the algorithm so for example if i want to use sha algorithm command is sha1 algorithm sha1 sum and then i use the file name uh, maybe it's not available in this uh, term, uh, Linux uh, Mac terminal. Let's see. I, it's a Mac terminal is SHA sum. Come on. In the uh, Ubuntu terminal, is it SHA one sum? Right? So you see SHA sum in the file name. So this is the hash of SHA. So this is the hash of MD5. You see SHA hashes are much larger. If you want to use SHA256, I think there is an algorithm called a command called SHA256. Yes, uh, it's, it's called SHA256D in my machine, right? So, this is basically hash of that uh, 256 bits, right? Long hashes like that. There is already existing commands, right? Let me now. Uh, show you if i want to create i have i am in a directory i want to uh, create a, a hash of all the files in the particular directory how do you do it? i use md5 algorithm i say md5 and put star right hashing algorithm name md5 hash put star so star means all the files you see it's calculated all the files of hash there is a file called erase and there is a file called this, uh, and then this hash, this hash, uh, like that. You see, uh, it calculates the hash of all files. Have a look on very close view. Can you identify similar files there? So if there are similar files, then the hashes are same. By the way, when you calculate the hash of the file, they don't take the file name. They take only the content. So when this commands only take the content, not the file name, to calculate the hash. Even the file names are different. If the content is similar, so the hashes are similar. So that's how the hashes goes. So then if you look at this list, you might see there is a, a similar hash. Have a look, this one and that one is similar. That means this program and that program should be similar in in in, in uh, hash interpretation because similar content creates similar hashes so then i see similar hashes of course file names are different because file names are not taking into consideration calculating hash values so these two files are same so let me uh, show these two files actually these two files are <coughs> uh, executables so i will execute these two files I am executing a file called hello. So you see here, hello. So hash is this. It says hello, cousin. It's a simple C program, right? Then I see a file called erase. It also has the same hash here on top. You see, I'm running, running that program. So you say it's press enter to erase your hard disk. So it's a malicious program. And when I execute that, it says erase, erase in my hard disk actually it's this program is written by myself me so i am not erasing my hard disk myself it's just for demonstration purpose but if it is a bad guy they could do so right so then uh, you see so even both tasks are similar in these two program they works completely different so th how that happened that's happened because people have break the md5 hash break the md5 hash if they if we see the same md5 hash that doesn't mean the two content are same uh, so you saw it now now let's calculate sha 
SHA sum of the all files in the directory. Sorry, it's called SHA, SHA sum in the Windows system. So you see, SHA sum of all files. Then you see now the hash values. Uh, let's look at this hello. So this is the hash value of hello. And uh, then let's look at the uh, hash value of my erase. So here my erase. And so this is the hash value. So you see now it's two different hashes. Because it's SHA1 is not co uh, compromised so far. So SHA hashes are, can identify uh, independent contents. But MD5 can't. So there are methods of uh, doing that. So I give a URL if you want to try, you can try it yourself using MD5. There are methods published. People can find or create two different content which having same hash. So one is maybe genuine, other one may be with the malicious code. So if some software system or virus can or whatever, check the both of hashes, they, they, they see they both are equal and they think they are equal, uh, they are both programs are good programs. It's not so. So uh, you practically see that. So, so because of that, we say don't use MD5. Right. So now uh, let's say we want to uh, check the integrity of some directory. So then you can, what you have to do, first of all, you have to calculate the hash value of the files in that directory. So then uh, later on, you want to check someone, alter that file or not. How do you do that? So for that, what you should do, you have to save those hash values in the file. So for example, you calculate hash of all and redirect to maybe a file called SHA. So then there is a file called SHA in the directory. When I see this file, uh, so this consists of all hash values of the existing file. Right. Now, let's say somebody has altered some of your file. I use uh, uh, this my text file in the folder, I alter it. Maybe I delete some line of that file and save. So now the alt, I alter. How do you check that? If I want to verify later on someone alter the content of this uh, directory, what I should run, I say SHA sum comma minus C and the file which I store hash values. So I store the hash values on the file called SHA, you know, I give that name. So then, and execute it, right? So then what's happened? You see it say erase is okay, no change. This is also okay, no change. This is fine, no change, no change, no change, no change. And this is change. It's a fail. So, uh, so this test, has, somebody has changed. So like that, we can identify unauthorized alteration on our servers. So if you have critical servers, which need to be checked the integrity, you can calculate hash values of those files in this particular servers and save it somewhere else. You should not keep the hash values on the same folder. So then attacker may change the content and change that file as well. So don't store that in the same folder. After calculating it, you have to take that hash values uh, to your friend drive or different server and keep it there. And later on, if you want to verify uh, someone order it or not, you can put that file back to the uh, uh, checking directory and execute this comma. SHSM minus C with the file consists of hashes. So by doing that, you can verify uh, the integrity of this file system. So I show two things, how to verify the integrity of a file system or the important directory. And then I show how the MD5 is, has broke. Then uh, let's say if you want to reverse the hash, actually it's not decrypting, reversing the hash. So I, I already mentioned in the uh, 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 last week lecture as well, there are websites called reverse hash lookup websites. Right? So using such websites, I can reverse the hash values. So before that, let's calculate some hash value. So in the terminal, if I want to calculate a hash value of some MD5 hash, let's say MD5 hash of a word uh, called Kazun, uh, right? Let's say my password is Kazun. So what I want to do it then, 
I need to echo the word casual like that. So echo means it repeat on the terminal. Echo casual repeat the same word on the terminal. So I do echo and then I pipe that uh, to the MD5 algorithm. So it gives the MD5 of word cousin. However, when you echo the word, the systems automatically add new line character to the end. But when you type a username and the password, we are not uh, using this new line character uh, because we just use the words. And so then we need to tell the system don't use new line. So when echoing, if you say don't use new line, there is an option called minus n. They say echo minus n cousin, whatever. So you see, this cousin is uh, printed uh, same line. It don't go to the next line. So here you see that. Yeah, it's in the same line. So after that, it's from comes. So don't jump to the new line. So with minus n. So I use then minus n and then pipe it to md5. So that create a hash of the word cousin. So you see, this is and that different. Why this is different? This include a new line character, hidden new line character. So with minus every option, I remove that. Right. So this is the word of hash, uh, hash of the word cousin. So I copy that. I want to see whether this reverse hash lookup websites can reverse it. Let me share my uh, 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 web browser. So in the web browser, uh, I am in this reverse hash lookup website, which I have given in the slides. So then I put the hash values here. Here, the hash value, which I just calculate and say reverse. So you see it get reverse immediately and tells this hash is custom, right? So they are not breaking the hash as I, as I explained to you several times. They already know the word cousin name. It's common in Sri Lanka. The name, this is word is very common. So these words are online. So they already know those words and they calculate, pre-calculate the hash of those words and store in their database. Whenever we type this hash, they check their backend databases, whether that has access. So if that exists, they know which word. So they just reverse it, right? So that's how they reverse it. So that's how this reverse hash look websites works. All right. So I uh, uh, show you uh, uh, several demos now. And now let's back to our lecture. Uh, all right. Okay. Now let's uh, discuss what is MAC algorithms. Uh, hash algorithms, uh, you know, there is a message put it into the algorithm, create a short code. So what, what is MAC? MAC means message authentication code. Um, message authentication codes, sorry here, message authentication code has two inputs. One is the data, our messages, and other one is the security key. So they put a security key that is password while calculating hash values. So if you use a password while calculating hash values, that is called as MAC, message authentication code. So hashes don't have the secret key, MAC has that secret key. So that's the difference between hash and the MAC. So MAC values uh, usually use to check the message integrity in the communication. I will show you, I will discuss with this so you, you understand how it works. So the, let's say there is a message, letter packet, letter packet to be transmitted, web page to be transmitted from the browser to the server. So when it go reaches to the server, server should know someone will read, no, not. How do you do that? So for that, usually we use what we call it as MAC algorithms. So in the MAC algorithm, we put the data to be transmitted to this algorithm with the shared security key. K is the key. So this key shared between this browser, assume this browser side, assume this is server side and the server. 
So how do they share it? We'll discuss it in a later on. Right? Assume both browser and the server has the same key. So then what they do? They take the data to be transmitted, put to the hash MAC algorithm and with the security key K, and it has created what we call it as MAC now. So it's, a, it's actually a MAC means hash with the key. Right. So then they attach that to the message and transmit message and the MAC to the server side. So then server receives it. Right. Now server need to verify whether someone alter the content. So then what server do? Server get the content he received, put it to the algorithm with the key he knows and calculate that MAC value. And he also receiving the original MAC value. He compare these two MAC values together. If both MAC values match together, server knows no one order it. If they are different, server knows someone alter a message or MAC. We don't know, right? Any of these two, someone alter a message or a MAC. So then in both cases, server has to ask the retransmission from the browser. Or the other side. So that's how we practically use MAC algorithm to check the integrity of the message data, which is which passes in between uh, servers and the kind of other browsers or the clients. So there are protocols use these techniques. Uh, main protocol called TLS. I will discuss later on how this TLS work. It's a basic concept. Right, MAC. Uh, so there are in the practically there are pure MAC algorithms in the world, and but uh, those pure instead of this pure MAC algorithm, what we do we use simple hash algorithm together with a security key to calculate MAC. So hash algorithms are usually fast. So we use actually hash algorithms to calculate the MAC. Different between hash and the MAC <coughs> is MAC has the key, hash don't have. So what we can do, we can calculate, we can get our message, add the key to concatenate the key to that message, and then pass us to the hash algorithm. And take it as what we call hash map. If you do so, it's called it as hash map, hash map value, or in call it as H map in, in, in cybersecurity, right? Okay, that uh, concludes our kind of a short discussion on hash, MAC, and HMAC. Mainly, what are the purposes we are using with cybersecurity? Cybersecurity. So the hashes are mainly used for storing very uh, authentication codes or what we call passwords. Then MAC are used for check the data integrity during the communication right so these are the two main purposes of those algorithms right now we move on to discuss a little bit of what we call it as encryption when you want to when you discuss the encryption we can see two types of encryption in the world what we call it as symmetric key encryption and asymmetric key encryption let's first have a look on the symmetric key encryption symmetric key encryption works with a single key that means if you have some data to be protected, we apply this key to this encryption algorithm and convert into a different format. So that it has the ciphertext or encrypted data. Encrypted data is not visible to the people without knowing the key. There are people which we don't have the key. So if uh, let's say some person have the key, so then what he can do, he apply this key to this hypertext and decrypt that content and get back the plain text. So the same key, same security key used for the encryption process as well as decryption process. Because of that, we call it as a symmetric system. So if we want to use this system to exchange the data confidentially between the users and the servers, what they have to do they have to create that symmetric key, share it between the server and the client, 
and then server encrypt the data using that key and transfer it to the client. Then client decrypt it using the key he get and access to that. So that you should do. So the challenge in that system is how do you share the key, share that key between the server and the client. So that is the challenging task. So as long as we share it, the system works. How to share it is a challenge. We discuss later on. The other, this problem with the symmetric key system called it as key distribution problem. So the we, symmetric key systems are very strong systems. They could use it for encrypt and decrypt data very fast. The challenge there is how do you distribute this key between two endpoints? So that is the main challenge. Basically, uh, we use uh, a public key cryptography to distribute that. So I'll discuss that later on. Other main problem with this symmetric key system or any cryptographic system or any system, any information, any cybersecurity system is a brute force attack. So if that whatever the cryptography algorithm use 128 bit keys, the maximum keys what we can have is two to the power 128 bits. So this two to the power 128 bit key is the maximum keys we can have. So we can then search all available key space to find it out this key which keys are uh, matched to that so they can find all the keys search all the keys starting from all the keys they can search to match the corresponding key so that is called it as brute force attack so this problem with any cryptographic system especially with the classical cryptography or symmetric cryptography system Key distribution is the challenge. How do you send the same key from the server side to the client side is kind of a challenge, right? So then, uh, let me let me summarize what I said. So in the symmetric key systems, which heavily used, especially when you communicate between web browser and the web server. There is a protocol called TLS, transfer layer protocol. It uses symmetric key system to encrypt the data, which transmit between web server and the web browser. So they are very free system, efficient algorithm. If key size are large, hard to brute force, uh, it will be very suitable for bulk encryption. So for example, if you want to encrypt your hard disk entirely, the server system entirely, we can use this symmetric system. So weakness with that system is key distribution. How do you distribute the keys? How do you distribute the key from the server to the browser in the cybersecurity, for instance, in the cybersecurity? How to do that is a challenging task. And then if you use the same key between two pairs, so then they, these two parties can listen to each other. So because of that, we have to use separate key between separate a pair of communication. So if you have millions of pairs, we, have, we need to have trillions of keys. So then we have to kind of save them. It's not practical. So because of that, we say symmetric systems are not scalable and it cannot be used for authentication purposes as well. Because if you want to use that for authentication purposes, for what we call non repudiation purposes, you may understand what I mean later on. So these symmetric keys are not suitable. So these are the three main weakness. The major weakness with the symmetric is distribution. How do you send the same key, a share the same key between the server and the client? So that is the main weakness of that system. So there are protocols to distribute that. We will come to that. Right. Before that, let's discuss what are the symmetric systems available. In the symmetric systems, how do you write it? So usually we write is with encryption E, we usually represent decryption D. So we do encryption E with the key security key K uh, to our message. Message means our data, uh, usually call it as plain text, and it produces the ciphertext called Y. So when you put this ciphertext Y uh, to the decryption process with the security key K, DK means decrypt with the security key K. So it produced the plain text back. 
plain text to the encryption with key k having a ciphertext ciphertext decryption with the key k we get back the plain text this is a reversible algorithm hash is not so you understand that but encryption decryption symmetric encryption decryption can reverse using the same key so there are two major symmetric key algorithms in the world one we use at the beginning called data encryption standard maybe you heard about an algorithm called des the algorithm des is mainly used so the des algorithm has a key size of 56 bits 56 bit key size and 56 mean bit means you know it's a seven byte so uh, so if the key size is 56 bit maximum number of keys we can have is 2 to the power 56 so brute forcing this 2 to the power 56 bit keys is millisecond interval right now not recommended at all so if you are using this system in any cyber security configurations you have to eliminate that you should not use it as anymore because key size are short so there are uh, so you see this is the maximum number of keys so it could be bro bro it can be broken within the milliseconds right now so basically uh, in like 1980 1997 1998 it was a big task now it's not because we have faster machines we can search uh, in a short period of time <coughs> we need a method to improve the strength of those tests algorithm so there is a method which we use typically as this method is not recommending right now as well but some people are still use that method since they are cyber security applications so that method is called it has triple this triple this <coughs> triple this means basically encrypting the data several times using the same algorithm this algorithm so we have a plain text we encrypt that plain text with a security key called k1 and we use that encrypted data <coughs> apply the same key k2 and we use that output encrypted again using the security key called k3 that means we encrypt the data three times with three different keys with the same algorithm so if you do so that call is a triple list right then you might ask why do you stop at third time can't we do it maybe 10 times because we have fast machines now actually encryption is kind of scrambling the information the information will scramble in such a way people cannot find the content so that is encryption so we we scramble the data we again scramble in the data kind of mixing the data we mixing the data mixing the data mixing the data so if you continually try to do so you may understand we may end up with the same data back who knows so because of that we are not recommending to encrypting it over two times so we encrypt the data we encrypt the data again we are not recommending to encrypt it the third, third time however in the triple days recommend to do three times i will let you know why it's so usually in the triple days is encrypt the data with the key k1 encrypt it back with the key k2 encrypt with another key k3 so then someone need to brute force they has to brute force all three keys that take time right so because three keys need to be brute force you know, so then the number of termination now 56 bit plus 56 bit 56 bits all right so it's i think 168 bits then we have to go to us two to the power 168 bit combinations it's difficult it's difficult still but maybe in five years time it not it may not be difficult right so then let's assume so someone use plain text use a k1 here and create the data and in the second round, he used K1. Instead of K2, he used K1, whatever. So I mentioned that in the symmetric algorithm, ciphertext, put it into the algorithm, 
get the uh, plain text sorry plain text put it into the algorithm get the cyber text so we put back the cyber text same key create the decryption so someone put k1 and instead of k2 if he use the same key so here we get the plain text back the clear text will be encrypted here so we put the encrypted data and the same key we get the cipher text here uh, we get back the plain text here so because of that we are not recommended to use same key in two consecutive rounds if you use k1 k1 here it's a single disk if you k1 k1 here again it's a single disk because this round will neutral with the other round because those algorithms are symmetric algorithms some cases we use triple disk with two keys there how do we do we apply k1 here and k2 here k1 here we are not using k1 here k1 here and k2 here because then these two get neutral each other so that's how we use triple disk right okay uh, so uh, triple disk can be used with two keys as i mentioned k1 k2 and k1 or with three keys so even this triple key uh, triple key method or triple disk is not recommended so instead of there is a standard encryption algorithm available nowadays so that algorithm is called advanced encryption standard or aes aes algorithm this was uh, introduced to the world somewhere around 2000 by the US government. So since then, everybody in the world, uh, if they want to encrypt the data over the cyberspace, they use AES algorithm, Advanced Encryption Algorithm. If you want to get the detail of that, there is a publication available online called Federal Information Processing Publication 197. You can search for that. You may find documents as you can read detail of this AES algorithm. AES algorithm based on algorithm called Regindal uh, proposed by the uh, two Belgium researchers so the Belgium cryptographers they have pro proposed this regi algorithm called Regindal later on so international standardization organizations they accept it as the present standard for data protection so the present data protection standard is called AES advanced encryption standard from 2000 onwards we believe that could be used somewhere around 2030 because after that so aes can be broken even with the fast computers at next 10 years we never know okay when you have studied the aes algorithm uh, uh, we have to main thing what we have to look at is the key size so i i put other properties as well here but main thing is key size the key size they use three different key sizes 128 bit key 192 bit key uh, 256 bit key AES has three different key sizes right recommended key size right now is 256 bit AES keys for the encryption so that means if someone want to do sports they have to search for two to the power of 256 bit keys it's take years if someone try to do so it's take years very difficult to prove and very difficult to brute force so we recommend AES as the encryption algorithm for the uh, protecting our confidential data right i usually like to show you always demos some hands-on there you, you can use those for uh, useful tasks your day-to-day -day tasks plus your cyber security tasks or whatever as you want so now i would like to show you how do you simply encrypt your confidential file? Let's say you have some confidential file in your hard disk, you want to encrypt it, how do you do so? So in the any Linux based system or even Windows, there is a very good package available called OpenSSL. OpenSSL, OpenSSL is a very good cryptographic API where we can use for encrypt data, decrypt data, and so many other cryptographic operations. I will show you, anyone can get it, this library is uh, free of charge uh, and uh, it is a very strong cryptographic library, uh, OpenSSL, maybe you already heard about OpenSSL, OpenSSL.org. So OpenSSL 
kind of create uh, has uh, very stable versions so they they stand time of obviously they have bugs as well but you need to be kind of uh, uh, look at this uh, open ssl releases usually open ssl use in the uh, open ssl use in all the major operating systems like all linux based operating system core feature is the open ssl all uh, web servers including apache major web servers node.js apache or whatever in which provide the uh, tls so major cryptographic library they use is open ssl so if open ssl get compromised that means entire cyberspace get compromised something like that so open ssl is very stable so obviously they have some small small bugs uh, but they very fast they usually fix those so the world most heavily used cryptographic or the security libraries open ssl so so i recommend to use it if you if you use it for if you use any linux based system open ssl by default install because all the linux based operating system core functionality uh, applies or core functionality implemented by this api open ssl so you can use any linux prompt in my mac os also i i, I implemented uh, i installed open ssl but uh, in the uh, Linux systems, this by default comes. If we want to install it in Windows, you download and install it in Windows. Right, let me share my window uh, terminal and show you how simply we can use OpenSSL to protect a confidential file. Uh, right, so I share my terminal here uh, somehow. Uh, sorry, this is slides. Uh, let me share my uh, terminal here back. Right, this is my terminal. Now you see that. Uh, so I will move to some direct. Let's say I have some direct called OpenSSL. Uh, it has some content you can see. Right, so I just want to now uh, encrypt some file, some, some file in this directory. How, how do I do so? so let me show some file. Uh, so for example, uh, uh, maybe I, I better I, I, I share my desktop, the entire desktop, so you can see all the things together. Right, right. So this is my terminal. Now you see uh, there, and there are some files. I, I will pick some file in that folder uh, to encrypt. All right, uh, let me see. Uh, I go to my I uh, using my file browser. Uh, I'll I'll go to that scan folder. Uh, let me see where is this this under that I think uh, there is a direct call of this is right. So this is this is the folder uh, uh, we are looking at in the term. So you see it has a file, uh, maybe an image, image called uh, new, uh, new JPEG, right? New JPEG. So this is the image. So this is the image, right? I can open it in the image editor. So it's open. So this is uh, some image, right? So I just, let's say I just want to encrypt that. So maybe I delete some files here, uh, which did not necessary. So this is the image, right? So I want to now uh, protect that image. No one will be able to see that, right? So using OpenSS, how do you do that? So the command I have given already on the slide. Uh, so you see, if I want to encrypt a file, so this is the command. Uh, so in the terminal, I put that, sorry. So, uh, I will edit it a little bit. Uh, so and tell you what, what are the parameters. The program name tool I'm using is OpenSSL. So we type OpenSSL. What I want to do is encryption. So I do ENC encryption. And then I have to tell the algorithm to be used. 
So I say I am using AES algorithm in the 256-bit keys, and there is a, what we call operational mode, I'm not going to discuss later on in the cyber cryptographic course, I can discuss it later. So you type as it is. AES 256 CBC is basically the encryption algorithm I'm going to use. And then I need to tell which file I'm going to encrypt. I'm going to encrypt uh, my new .jpg file. Right. Then I have to tell slash out, minus out, and I have to tell which file I, I save it. So I'm going to encrypt this file and save it in, let's say, out.jpg. Right. So my input is this, my output is this. I encrypt in this algorithm using the uh, tool called of an SSL. Right. So let's enter it. So when I enter that, it has a password. Password to protect the uh, generate AES key. I have to enter twice. So it's encrypted. And it creates then file called out JPEG. So even it called JPEG, actually this, you see, it's not a JPEG file. So it cannot view, the system cannot view because it's encrypted. So no one will be able to see that unless otherwise they decrypt it back, right? So how do they decrypt it? So I have given the command here on the slide set. So this is how uh, you get decrypt. So you have to type like this. You have to type open SSL again, ENC for using encryption minus D. So I don't know why do they use it instead of ENC minus D, they could call it as D decrypt. But the open SSL developers, they uh, use the command, create the command as open SSL encrypt minus D. D minus D represent for decryption. And tell the algorithm, it should be the same algorithm, and then tell the input file. Now input file is actually encrypted file, that is out.jpg, and then have to tell decrypted file using minus out. Then you say minus out and tell uh, which file you want to save. Let's say cousin.jpg. So then this encrypted file will decrypt and save it in this. Right. So in order to decrypt that, system require key. So I have to type the same password to generate the key. Okay, I typed it. So I hope I will type the correct password. So then it ended up with a, a file called cousin.j. Let me see in the file browser. So that is available. Uh, let's hear, here it is available. You see, I got the same, same picture, same picture. That means this get decrypted back to the correct picture since I typed the correct key to enter the correct key. So using that open SSL tool, we can uh, encrypt, decrypt any file, video, whatever, with any size. So after encrypt it, it's very hard to break. It. So, so like open SSL, there are so many commands. So if you want to see that, to say open SSL, uh, open SSL, then minus H, uh, it gives the health. So all the cryptographic algorithms in the world has implemented and bundled to your Linux based OS. If you want to use it in Mac OS or in, in other ways, you have to install it separately from the OpenSSL website. Otherwise, with the Linux based OS, it's the by default comes. It's a matter of using that too. All right. So that's how we can simply use encryption and decryption. Uh, to protect the files. Similarly, there are protocols available, as I mentioned, the protocol called TLS, available to encrypt the data between browser and the web server to achieve the cybersecurity. So I'll explain TLS later on, right. So let's move on to the lecture by sharing my uh, lecture slides back. All right, so we did that. So then when let's, uh, we want to discuss a little bit of asymmetric key encryption, All right? So, so I, before I move on to that, I will repeat the symmetric key encryption. Problem is the key distribution. We have a problem of sharing this key between sender and recipient. 
సో ఐ సో డిమో సో దే ఐ డిట్ ఎన్క్రిప్షన్ డీక్రిప్షన్ ఆన్ మై సేమ్ ల్యాప్టాప్ రైట్ సో ఐ ఆమ్ ద సెండ్ యాజ్ ఎల్ రిసీవ్ సో ఐ ఐ నో దట్ సో ఐ కెన్ ఎన్క్రిప్ట్ అండ్ డీక్రిప్ట్ ఇఫ్ వి టూ పీపుల్ ఆబ్వియస్లీ వి కెన్ టాక్ టు ఈచ్ అదర్ అండ్ పాస్ అవర్ కీ దట్ వర్క్స్ రైట్ బట్ ఇఫ్ ఇట్ ఈస్ సైబర్ సిస్టమ్ వి డోంట్ నో ద కార్డ్ ఈస్ వి talk to each other we we have a problem of passing our symmetric key uh, to each bit so that is the problem how do you achieve that in order to achieve that we have to use what you call as key distribution algorithm most of the key distribution algorithm use the system called public key public key system right so let's have a look how this public key system works in very abstract level so then later on we will discuss this key distribution algorithm the public key is uh, a public key cryptography mainly used for key distribution in addition to that public key cryptography used for what we call it as digital signatures uh, to achieve the authentication and non repudiation digital signatures usually used to achieve authentication non repudiation so and as well as data integrity i'll come to that later on so the digital signatures can create using the public key cryptography the first public key cryptography algorithms introduced to the world by the person called dt and elman so we call it as dt elman public key cryptography algorithm detail of those algorithms it's a separate course we discuss these are just the concepts to understand the protocols right okay so in the public key cryptography system basically have six ingredients six components what you call plain text now we can see that encryption algorithm which do the encryption and then there are two keys in the symmetric key algorithm we only use same key we use one single key to encrypt and decrypt in the public key system we use two keys one for encryption other one for decryption and then we have a cipher text and then we have decryption algorithm there is a plain text encryption algorithm two keys cipher text and decryption algorithm let's understand how it works in very very simple level. right so basically in the public key system so two algorithms are available encryption and decryption and then uh, so then uh, it could use for encrypt decrypt data and it could use for uh, digitally sign the data and it could use for key exchange key distribution so symmetric system has a problem of distributing the key we use actually public key system or system to distribute those keys so that's why we say main application of public key cryptography is key exchange key exchange in addition to the key exchange we can use that system to do this as well practically what we do we generate a symmetric key is as key and use this public key cryptography algorithm to distribute that symmetric key from one side to the other side so that's what we do so in mainly in the cyber security cyber security both system works i'll discuss later on in detail right now let's try to understand in in very abstract level how this public key system works in the public key system starts with the recipe so that's other people, some people couldn't understand in the symmetric system basically start with the send the person who going to send the information but in the public key system should start from the opposite the person who wants to receive this information so let's say who you want to receive some data from me then in this public key system first of all you have to send your public key to me right your public key to me you have to send so then uh, i receive your public key let's say you are alice and i receive your public key to me then what what i do actually i would get my plain text the data to be encrypted and apply your public key to that data and transmit that to you right so the encryption goes with your public key encryption goes with alice public key or the recipient public key right so then we transmit to the recipient so then recipient has to decrypt that the decryption goes with the other key public key system has two keys i mentioned so there is other key called private key so the alice should use his private key to decrypt that data 
So decryption goes with the LA's private key. Encryption goes with the LA's public key. So if I, if you want to get some confidential data from me, you have to send your public key to me. If you want to get encrypted data from my, you have to send your public key to my. So if you want to get encrypted data from Ted, you have to send your public key to Ted. So whoever party you receiving your public key will encrypt that data using that public key. After encrypt that, so that public key cannot use to decrypt the information. So public key is only used to encrypt the information. So the decryption goes with the corresponding private key, right? So the corresponding private key, usually you have to take it in your custody. You should not distribute your private keys. In this public key security systems, private keys keep sacred. So that's why they call it as private keys. These keys keep it in your machine, the sacred. So you are not distributing this. You keep your private key safe in your machine. So then when you receive that data, you apply your private key and get back this data, right? Public keys are distributed to everywhere, all the people. So for example, if I want to get a confidential data from you, first of all, I have to create public private keys and then I keep secure or save my private key in my machine. I'm not going to give anybody this key and I transmit my public key to you. So after you receive your public key, you can encrypt that data using my public key and sense to me. So then I can recover that by applying my private key. So recovering goes with the public key. That means decryption goes with the private key. Encryption goes with the public key. So that's how it works. Every party who wants to use this system should have public private key pair. So let's apply to the now cybersecurity. In the cybersecurity dimension, there are two major parties who want to talk to each other. One is the web server, other one is the browser. Browser, browser wants to connect to the web server securely. So then how do they talk to each other securely? In conceptually, when browser wants to talk to the web server securely, web server should send his public key. Web server should send his public key to the browser. I'll show you how to how that happens and so on later on. So usually web server sends his public key to the browser. Then browser create the data or whatever he has this uh, the, the data you entered or the data or whatever HTTP get request to get the data from the server whatever this data he protected using the public key of the web server and sends that data to the web server. So then web server no, only knows his private key. So web server knows his private key, he using that private key, he retrieve that data. So that's very abstract level, but in detail, there are very detailed protocol. I'll take it later on how this protocol works. Uh, so basically, whoever the party wants to confidentially talks has to send his public key first uh, to the information sent. So then he protect that data using this recipient's public key and then sends that. So that's how the system works uh, in public key system. So in this system, everybody in the world or the entities who talk to each other should have public private key. Yeah. As you know, normally browsers don't have, but in the cyber system, web servers has. If you want to have encryption, encrypted emails, I'll take it later on. Uh, then you have to have your public private key pairs. So we will uh, see the application of that public private key later. Right. Okay. So now, what's happen if you do so? So I mentioned, so when you encrypt the data with the public key, we have to decrypt it using the private key. So that system works opposite as well. That means if you encrypt the data with the private key, so we can decrypt it using the public key. So we, if you encrypt with the public key, decrypt with the private key. Encrypt with the private key, decrypt with the public key. That's, this, they, they work in both, both ways. But usually we have to keep the one key that is a private key and we distribute the other key that is a public key to the recipients.
people. So the people then use my public key to send the encrypted data to me. So that's how it works, right? So, however, other way around also works. So for example, I can encrypt my data using my private key. So for example, let's say I am a Bob, Bob encrypt the data using the private key of Bob. So if so, which key we Bob want to decrypt that? If that data need to be decrypted, so we need to have the other key, other means Bob public key. Then Bob's public key can be used to decrypt the data. If we encrypt the data with Bob's private key, Bob's public key can be used to decrypt the data, right? So who has access to this Bob's public key? So let's say I'm Bob. So I have sent that public key to all the world, you know, people who wants to send me the data. So that means everybody who got my public key has access to it. So maybe anyone access to it. Who don't know, everybody access to my public key. So that means if I encrypt that data using my private key, so anyone in the world can decrypt that. Right? So obviously you can understand there is no confidentiality required achieved in this process. There are no confirmation because anyone can be it no. So however, that is very important process. It achieved the authentication. Authentication. Authentication means anyone decrypt that using the Bob's private key proves Bob created that information. Right? Otherwise, it should use my public key. I say my create key. That means encrypt with the private key of my. Then we need to have public key of mine to decrypt that, right? Actually, we use public key of Bob to decrypt. So that means Bob created it. Bob created this information, right? So that it is we call authentication. Authentication of authentication using the public key. So that is very important. So you see these two scenarios which I discussing. So first one is the encryption. Encryption goes with the public key of the recipient that is Alice public key and decrypt it using the Alice private key. Then, then I discuss authentication. Authentication goes with the Bob's private key and decrypt with the Bob's public key. So opposite. So there are several algorithms, public key algorithms in the world. So RSC is the major algorithm. And the other one is called Diffie-Hellman. The first public key cryptography algorithm is Diffie-Hellman, later in, introduced in 1976, a long time ago. And then RSA introduced. Now, the most popular public key cryptography algorithm is elliptic curves. Elliptic curves. Especially elliptic curves are more efficient when it works on the term, uh, uh, devices, small devices, right? But in the web system, what right now we are using is uh, elliptic curve algorithm most of the time we recommend to use elliptic curve together with the element i will discuss in other other others at the beginning of this public key systems actually rsa use heavily in the web and the browser communication nowadays we use rsa only for authentication purposes and then uh, dp element and elliptic curve use for encryption purposes right so so I mentioned it used for signing. So it used for digital uh, signing or authentication purposes. So this digital signing process is kind of a little complicated process. So this public, first of all, I must say, uh, when I compare this public key system with the symmetric system, classical systems, public key systems are slow. Because public key systems use very heavy mathematics. So because of that public key cryptography systems are really slow. So if you try to use public key systems itself to do encryption, decryption, signing, verification like that, uh, you have to spend a lot of time. It's a slow. So we are not directly using public key system. Always we combine this public key system with hashing or symmetric key system. If you want to practically use this public key system, we have to combine it with hashing or symmetric system. So we combine it with hashing when you use public key system to digitally sign content. So let's say what is digital signature means. So we have some data to be digitally signed. 
the lead signature process uh, which use in cyber security so first of all we have the data we have to calculate this hash of the data so using any hashing algorithm which we discuss so then we we encrypt this hash using the private key of the site right we encrypt it using my private key instead of if i am signing i encrypt it using my private key so encrypted hash is called it as the signature encrypted hash call it as a signature so we have to add our signature to the document together with what we call a public key certificate we'll come to that later what it is signature attach that to the date so then we call it as digitally signed document digitally signed document digitally signed document consists of our data and encrypted hash of this date using the private key so how do we verify so then we send this digitally signed document to some party our recipient recipient has to verify my signature how do we verify that so recipient receives the digitally signed data so he get the data out of this document he get the signature out of this document signature means encrypted data so then since he get the data he want to verify whether that data get, get that data get altered or not he calculate the hash of this data he has the hash so then we have encrypted hash here this is original hash so in order to verify we need to decrypt this hash so this hash is encrypted here using the private key of the sender so then we have to decrypt it using the public key, corresponding public key we have to decrypt that using the corresponding public key. so after we decrypt that we should get the same hash here so those both hash must be equal. both has must be equal if it is not equal so somebody has tampered this document or somebody has tampered the signature so you see so that is the signature verification process so this is signature creation process this is signature verification process signature creation process as hashing and encrypting using a private key verification process use again hashing here and decrypt as has using the public key so so as you may understood here we use hash because of hash we achieve a security property what we call integrity if those both hashes are equal that means same document so no one alter so we achieve the data integrity so then we use what we decrypt that using the public key of the sender so we must use public key of that party so that is we knows that data from this person so if you use public key of someone else this is not that decrypted so we have to use the public key of the sender so that proves he says that document he says that document because we can decrypt it using his public key. so we knows then he sends it so that is actually authentication that signature provide the authentication then similarly this process which i describes legalized in most of the countries i am not aware about situation in bangladesh but in sri lanka and most of the countries this digital signature uh, legally accepted in front of the court because of that if someone digitally sign later on they cannot deny that they cannot say i didn't do that because then if they did so we can go to the courts and prove that because it's electronically valid evidence electronically valid legal evidence right because it's legalized so because of that we say this process provide the non repudiation non repudiation means stop repudiating the action especially needed in case of financial transactions so this process provide the non repudiation so if someone asks what are the security features provided by the digital signing so actually three security features what we call it as confident uh, integrity authenticity and non repudiation integrity authenticity and non repudiation are the three security features provided by this signing process however so the data is still in the plain text data is not encrypted 
because of that this sign emphasis not provide the confidentiality so the data anyone can see that but they can't alter or change but people knows that from this person so data is still in play so if you want to have confidentiality we need to go for encryption but here we discuss signing signing only provide integrity authenticity and non repudiation security features so in this short demo we sh we say we so how to sign and verify i will take it later on this demo and i want just want to discuss about strength of those public key cryptography algorithm uh, and i see, compare it with symmetric key so usually in the public key cryptography algorithm has larger key sizes larger key sizes so among them the recommended public key cryptography algorithm is elliptical elliptical public key cryptography algorithm most of the cyber security communication between browser and the web server uses elliptical and uh, for key exchange purposes i'll discuss how that how it happened later on uh, so data encryption happens with the symmetric key not the public key right i repeatedly say public key cryptography algorithm only used for key exchange so the data encryption goes with the symmetry so what happened so as i mentioned in principle what happened let's take our example web browser and the web server if web server web browser connect to a web server using a protocol called tls we discuss in detail later on so what happened web server sends its public key to the browser public key to the browser then browser create what we call it as random number one time random number that is called as a session key session key that session key used for aes algorithm for encryption right so the data is encrypted between browser and the server using aes right so then after browser generate the session key that key to be sent to the server no? so for that purpose browser encrypt that session key using the public key of the server so that's what they do browser encrypt that session key with the public key of the server and sends that to the server server can then decrypt it using his private key and then both party has the session key, same session key and then they can talk to each other by encrypting the encrypting this data using that session key so that's how typical rsa public key uh, high uh, public key key exchange works so since that use public key and symmetric key together we call it as hybrid encryption systems the system has some weakness what we call it as forward secrecy i'll discuss that requirement of forward secrecy later on right so so the situation which i discuss is similar like that so we have uh, uh, servers uh, and then two parties want to communicate let's say this is a web server is a browser so if browser wants to talk to the server then browser has to get his public key right so when the browser get the public key of server so the question is how browser knows this public keys really belongs to this server a right so maybe someone else send the public key saying this is the public key of server a after browser receive a public key let's say b is a browser how this b knows this public key belongs to a how do they know so that's the problem so public key system works nicely but we have to solve that problem we have to find the create a mechanism to make sure a public key this public key is a this public key is b how do you do so, so there is a method we create for that it called as certification authority or what we call as cs certification authority role of the certification authority is to certify in the public key 
certify means tells that this public key is A, this public key is B. Role of the CEA is to do that. In order to do that, the certification authorities charge money. The certification authorities usually charge money. So you have to pay the certification authorities and obtain what we call it as public key certificate. So that public key certificate tells this public key belongs to the server. So then server can send that public key certificate to the browser, then browser can accept that public key as a valid public key. So in order to do so, browser must trust the certification authority because certification authority is the party tells this is the public key of this server. So we must trust that particular certification authority to accept that, right? So as I mentioned, so the public key certification authority or the CA servers are available in the world. They are issuing a kind of electronic certificates, what we call X509 public key certificates to the web servers in the world. So those public key certificates usually sent to the browsers before starting these sessions or TLS sessions. So this public key certificate has standard format so it's called xy09 format it has some set of attributes predefined attributes for subject is the owner of that public key issuer is the who is certifying that public key valid period is how long this public key going to be used and some other admin information so this is standard xy09 is the standard so when you want to define the owner and the subject of the public key so there are attributes used. So those attributes called distinguished name attributes. So they are eight attributes. You should, uh, so there are some, uh, sorry, th these are the structure of public key certificate. So it has, as I mentioned here, it has, uh, it has here subject issuer validity period and so on. So these are the additional attributes like uh, sub issuer is there, subject is there, validity period is there, public key information is there, and then digitally signed by this authority so then when you take a subject and the issuer so there are set of attributes set of attributes available so it's called a distinguished name attribute using this distinguished name attribute we can uniquely identify issuers uh, and the subjects that mean one of the public keys in the world so they these attributes are countries state and lo province, locality, organization name, organization unit, and common name, email address, and the URL. So if you issue a public key certificate to a web server, the common name usually consists of the domain name of the web server. So domain name of the web server need to be put it there, and then we have to get the public key from some public key authority. Uh, it then consists of your public key. So this is public key certificate which look like. I'll show some demo later on in my TLS lecture uh, to show you how these public keys look like and then the, how public key certificates look like. So then, as I mentioned, before we use the public keys, somehow, some, someone has to certify that public key belongs to this server so this people who certifying it called certification authorities then our browser should know what are these certification authorities so browsers has a list of the certification authorities installed in their browser so those list of certification authorities call it as trust list so those trust list is available in the browsers so basically when a uh, browser receives a public key certificate from a web server, browser verifies against this trust list. I'll show you later on how that thing look like and how the browser verifies that. That's kind of an end of this lecture today. Uh, maybe I will take some uh, questions if they have. Uh, and then we will close up the session. So I will take back this certification authority business and then TLS protocol uh, in the next lecture. So uh, let me 
uh, get some questions in, uh, in the uh, concepts. So, for example, if you have any problems with the symmetric key hashing and the public key system and how it works, if it is not clear, let's ask now. The rest of the things, certification authorities, signatures, key distribution, I'll take it back again because of that we not not clear about those you don't need to worry too much about it right now today let's clear it out hashing symmetric key public key system and how it works if you still have problem with these three let me know so i can explain it in next uh, few minutes any questions uh, Okay, I think people are typing the question. So I will answer from the top to the bottom. Uh, so there is a question uh, uh, from attendee. He is asking, is that the sold value added by the system or the user? Sold added by the system. Uh, when we store in the username and the password, usually sold added by the system. So and sold is saved together with the hash of the password. So then there is this question, if there are two users with the same username, how can we, how can the system identify corresponding password of one user? Okay, so basically uh, I forgot to mention, so for example, if we just store the hash of the password with the users, so we store it with the username. So we store the username and the hash of the password. Username and the hash of the password. So then, Obviously, if we can see two equal hashes, then we should know these two users using the same password. So that problem is there as well. So that's why we usually, uh, that's uh, another reason we add the sold. So what the system do, even the same user, even the user type same password, two different users are in the same password, system randomly add two different solds. So then hash values are, different so they may not end up with the unique cash values so then the problem you discuss here not there when you add to solves right so then there is a question is it possible any algorithm to reverse hash if not if it is not used before actually there are no not possible to do reversing hash because it's, it's we, what we reduce infinite set to a finite code. So using looking at the finite code, we cannot find it reversing back. But we can guess. We can guess there are some different attacks, what we call uh, 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 birthday attacks, which do brute forcing and say as well as either brute force or either search. So algorithmic level, we cannot reverse hash values. Right. Then there is a question, Razid Al Safi, asking if I encrypt the plain text with Bob's public key, then Bob's only decrypted. If I encrypt it using the Bob's public key, then Bob can only decrypt. Correct. That's correct. So what in the system happens? So if I am Alice, Alice want to send the confidential information to Bob. Bob should send his public key to Alice. So then Alice encrypt that information using the Bob's public key, not the Alice public key, Bob's public key, and sends to Bob. So then Bob's decrypted using his private key. So the system goes reverse. So that's what I mentioned. So if we should, so if Alice encrypt using Alice public key, only Alice can get it. So then Bob cannot get it. So what we want to do is we want to pass confidential data to Bob. So then we have to ask Bob's public key and then encrypt that data using the Bob's public key and send to Bob, then Bob can decrypt using his private key. Right. Then there is the question, does two separate word hash be the same? Does two separate words? So it's the question is not clear. So for example, uh, if two words are the same, then hash is the same. It doesn't matter it's, if it is two separate words. If these two separate words are the same word, so the hash is actually the same. 
So then there is a question, if I encrypt the end test with Bob public key, then Bob can only decrypt it? Yes, it is secure to send the ciphertext through the public channel to Bob with or without certification authority or required certification authority in the public key infrastructure. So actually, uh, this is two questions. So, so I think I have answered first part. So then, uh, so public key can be sent through a public channel. So, because if a symmetric key system, same key used for encryption and decryption. So when you use the same channel to send the symmetric keys, someone can take the symmetric key. So then it's not possible. So that's why we say symmetric key system has key distribution problem. But in the public key system, we are sending public key through the network. So private key we keep. The key we use for decryption, we are not sending it. It keep it in our hard disk or whatever secure place. So anyone can get the public key of us. So it, it's no problem with that because by getting the public key, they can do is encryption of the data to me. If I send the public key to someone else, some hacker can take that public key. What he can do is encrypt the data to me. He cannot decrypt the data because in order to decrypt that, he should have my private key, but private key is in store in my hard disk. So that's the conceptual how it works. The challenge here is how the recipients knows this is my public key or someone else's public key. So the certification authority come to play the role at that point. So when I send my public key to you, you should know, you see, actually it's my public key. Because when I through, send the public key through the public channel, someone can take that public key and inject a bogus public key saying this is cousin's public key. So then you are receiving not really my public key, someone else public key. So then you think it's my public key and encrypt that. I cannot decrypt, but someone else can decrypt. So that is the problem. So in order to achieve, uh, so that problem, the certification authority comes to play the role. So certification authority are the kind of entities who is certifying this public key is really cousin. So as long as you trust that certification authority, so you can accept that is correct public key for me. So then you can use that to protect the information to me. So that's why we require certification authority to certify our public keys. Otherwise, someone else can replace those public keys and cheat, right? Then there is a question, do certification authority in public infrastructure can create security vulnerabilities? I, I will answer that question later on in the other lecture. So Mr. Rasid al Zavi, very good question. Do certification authority in public key infrastructure can create security vulnerability? Yes, in, in simple speaking, the certification authority is, or public key infrastructure is not really a perfect solution. I'll exactly discuss that in the, my next lecture. So please hold on. So then, uh, there is a question, is Viber secure to send encrypted data? Uh, so Viber use somehow public key. I never use Viber anyway. I'm not a social network guy. I'm, I, I don't appear on social networks, Facebook, Viber, these things I'm not using. Uh, Viber encrypt the data, I think, using the public key system. Uh, but they, I, they, I guess they believe at the middle. So they are not doing into any encryption. I, I'm not so sure. I will have a look and let you know with how the Viber do the encryption. And then there is a, a question asking, we have heard so much about cryptocurrency nowadays. Is, is there any similarity between cryptocurrency and cryptography? Ah, okay. Uh, cryptocurrency is actually, uh, so, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, Monero coin, uh, basic asset attention token. There are so many cryptocurrencies, uh, cryptocurrency uh, systems and blockchains available. So all use cryptography, all use cryptography. Cryptocurrency are application of, another application of cryptography. So, you know, we are discussing uh, cybersecurity 
applications, cyber security applications like encryption. So the cryptography used for that. Similarly, cryptography used for generating currencies, new currencies, right? Cryptography is fundamental for cybersecurity as well as cryptocurrencies as well. Cryptocurrencies are another separate topic. If, if I start talking it, which might need hours, so I just skip that. So you just, the simple answer is, cryptography is the fundamental of cryptocurrency. So that means another cryptography, cryptocurrency is the application of cryptography, another application of cryptography, right? So we have encryption algorithm, methods of RSA, DES, so we know how hash function, now know how hash function works. We have encryption, do we know how hash function Actually, hash functions are the same as RSA does. It's a separate algorithm. I can give you in detail how those algorithms work. Actually, I didn't go in detail of how hash algorithm works because there's a separate course on uh, cryptography. So the similar like RSA does, hash is the same kind of cryptographic algorithm. Uh, so the algorithms I dis discuss in the class Mentioned in the class, actually, I didn't discuss the algorithm. Mentioned in the class is MD5 and SH family. So there is a similar like RSDS, there is an algorithm inside that. Right. Slice 21 started the controversy of this. Please let me know what is controversy for that. I have to go. I'll come to back, come back. What is slides? Uh, let me see slide. Uh, uh, he's talking about slide. Uh, 21. Uh, let me see. Let me forget. Slides 21. Control. Controversy. It has been submitted. It has been considerably controversy of it. So, what I mean here basically, so this size of this desk is now uh, 56 bit. So then having this uh, 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 56 bit encrypted desk cannot recommend at uh, And then uh, sometimes kind of even few years ago, so like in 90s, 1999, 1994, some people has a problem of this controversy on the desk because this algorithm is kind of introduced by the US government and some people doubt they know how to break it like that. So that's why I mentioned that in this uh, 20, slide 21. Anyway, forget about this now. This should not use anymore. So the AES is the algorithm we should use right now. And then there is a question, what is the maximum number of keys? Uh, maximum number of keys uh, based on the algorithm. So for example, if you use this, uh, uh, size is 56. Maximum number of keys to the power six fifty six. If you use AES, there are three key sizes: one hundred and twenty eight bit, one hundred and ninety two bit, and two fifty six bit. Recommended key size is two hundred and fifty six bit. So we can use two to the power two hundred and fifty six maximum keys. And which protocol is much better to encrypt the data over the web? Uh, encrypt the data over the web. The Fundamental protocol we use called TLS, Transport Layer Security Protocol, TLS. That is the standard which you use to encrypt the data between the web server and the browser, TLS protocol. So there, we have to configure the algorithms, security algorithms. Recommended security algorithm for encryption of the data always A is 256-bit key. It's the recommended algorithm. Web also use that, right? The protocol is TLS. I'll take it in detail later. AES algorithm follow this structure and it has 16 rounding. Triple this has 16 three times rounding this three round. No, 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 no. So the this, of course, that you are correct, use this structure and has 16 rounding. So that's a one, one cycle of this. So that do three times in the triple this. That's only it do. Uh, uh, that's actually 16 to three times rounding for just uh, actually three rounds, three, 16 into three times of rounding, right? 
because one day's encryption is 16 now, and we do it three times. So it's 16 into three, three times of rounding. Pradeep Kumar asked that question. It's 16 into three times of rounding. And so can you give the process of encryption command of password in the uh, presentation? Uh, can, can you give the process of encryption command of password in the process? I, I am actually using hash values to uh, a password. Okay. So, okay, I, I, will, I will give it. I will, I will have a look and give it. Um, uh, uh, right, I will give it later. Uh, that is using Linux. Uh, password. Uh, command of password in. It is using. Okay, I, I will give it. This two, two uh, then later on. Okay. The question is, I have a question from the previous class. How can we ensure that machine won't get infected if we go to open source since virus is also a program which is infected? Um, uh, as I mentioned, whether it is open source or the closed source software, we cannot 100% ensure so we are uh, machines are not in infected. But I mentioned there is a low risk if you use open source comparing to the uh, closed source. That's what I mentioned. So there are no mechanism can kind of get it 100% sure this is not infected. No. So obviously you can have intruder detection systems in place, personal firewalls in place, virus scanners in place, install in new machine if you want better security. So those devices, virus scanners, intruder detection systems, firewalls may detect if infection happens in your machine, whether it is open source or closed source. But usually open source machines has less probability having uh, uh, interviews. So that's what I mentioned. This browser sends both session key and the send this public key to the server. Actually, I will explain this TLS protocol later on. Usually what happens, web server sends the public key to the browser. Browser doesn't sense. Uh, in the TLS protocol has a capability to use browser to send that public key, uh, but uh, it is optional. Usually web browsers don't have public private keys. Web servers have. So because of that web server sends public private key uh, to the browser, not the other way around. Then who makes session key? Browser or the Browser. Browser usually makes the session key, not the server. Because other way around not works because browser browser don't have public private key. Server has public private key. Server sends his public key to the browser. Browser makes the session. And that's it. And then there is the question: Which process is more secure in cryptography? Which process is more secure? Uh, it's not clear. This question is not clear. So basically, cryptography is used for. Uh, productions so there are several algorithms as I mentioned in case of hashing so recommended is SHA256 we, we, we can use symmetric key encryption for confidentiality in case of symmetric key encryption recommended cryptography algorithm is AES256 uh, hashing SHA256 encryption AES256 then when you come to the public key cryptography, there are three algorithms, RSA, DVLMAN, elliptical. All three are recommended for three different purposes. So usually RSA used for encryption and signing purposes. Uh, DVLMAN and elliptic key used for key exchange purposes. So RSA now not recommended for key exchange. I'll take that later on. So DVLMAN and elliptic key used for key exchange. RSA useful signing. So these are the recommended algorithm names. Can we get recorded videos? I think so, no? So I think the Bangladesh uh, uh, Enron, which is uh, facilitating this course, uh, will share the uh, lectures. Uh, so maybe you can answer, right? Okay, that's in maybe uh, Bangladesh uh, 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 moderators who listen in for that, take it.
Yes, sir. Yes, you can. You can explain this. They are asking this uh, recorded lectures. Yes, all the recorded is stored in our website www.dle.asiaconnect.bdn.net.bd in video gallery. Um, videos, DLE course video here. Maybe maybe you can share these uh, links with the participants, yes. including including me. So so then we, can, we uh, the people well, can also listen. can download the presentation slide. Right. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, I think that's uh, 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 there was another question uh, at the end asked what his mechanism used in bit local. Uh, maybe I will take it later on so then it's to, uh, it goes uh, beyond the two hours. Uh, I will discuss bit local later on. Uh, and maybe we can close the session, right? So it's now over two hours. Uh, so we close the session. Next session is on 20th Saturday, uh, 3 at Bangladesh time, correct?